Okay, hey, welcome everybody to the fifth lecture in the 2021 New Vistas in Astronomy series presented by the Fred Lawrence Whipple Observatory. The Whipple Observatory is the largest field observatory of the Center for Astrophysics, Harvard and Smithsonian. And we're located near Amato, Arizona, which is about 45 miles south of Tucson. 2021 is the 51st year of this lecture series informing the residents here and around the world this year about what's happening at the observatory that everybody can see usually in Green Valley. Today, we're honored to have Dr. Anthony Tony Stark of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory, who is a lead scientist at the South Pole Telescope Observatory. Tony Stark earned a degree in physics and astronomy from the California Institute of Technology and went on to uh, earn a doctorate in astrophysical sciences in, at Princeton University. He became a member of the technical staff at Bell Laboratories in Radio Physics Research Group, where he worked on high frequency radio instrumentation. He is author of over 300 articles in scientific journals, including the Bell Laboratories High Survey and Bell Laboratories Co Survey, two of the largest and most frequently used data sets in our, of our Milky Way galaxy, along with fellow Bell Lab scientist Mark Dragovan. Stark made some of the first measurements to establish the Antarctic Plateau as a superior observatory site for sensitive radio astronomical observations. He has worked at the Admonson Scott South Pole Station for 18 summer seasons since 1986. He was the principal investigator and designer of the Antarctic Submillimeter Telescope and Remote Observatory a 1.7 meter diameter telescope that operated at the pole for a decade. He was the founder, he was one of the founders of the Center of Astrophysical Research in Antarctica, an NFF Science and Technology Center that established and operated an observatory with four telescopes at the pole. In 1991, he became an astronomer with a radio and geoastronomy division of the Smithsonian Astrophysical Observatory. Currently, he is the co-principal investigator of the South Pole Telescope, a 10-meter diameter telescope that became operational in February 2007. Today, Tony's going to talk about how astronomy can save your life and the search for new Earth objects that they're looking for, some of the big asteroids and that that are flying around in, in our system. So, Tony, take control. Okay. Um, so, uh, I'm first going to show this video, which is, which is just on YouTube. It's, uh, it's a compiled video of, uh, of uh, events around Chelyabinsk in uh, 2013, when it was very nearly hit dead on by a large meteor. Uh, fortunately, no one was killed. And uh, it, uh, oh dear. Yes, of course, during the talk, it's suddenly not behaving. View. There we go. So these are a bunch of random security cameras that were on when the near miss occurred. Here's a fellow who was lucky.
not to be the first human casualty of a meteor. So this, this was a near miss. Uh, if the trajectory had been a little bit different, it would have been, it would have essentially destroyed the city. And that's the point of, of this talk, which is, which is only peripherally connected with my, with my main work, but I, I, I do fit into it as I'll, as I will uh, get to later. The meteor as it exploded in the atmosphere was 30 times brighter than the sun, which is what you just saw there. Okay, let me see if I can get back to my actual talk. Okay, here we go. Um, so, um, the point of this talk is that um, we now have new technology which can uh, do a very much better job in, in, uh, in finding and uh, predicting events like this in the future. And uh, it may become uh, a valuable thing uh, to, to be able to, to predict that there's a, a region, perhaps the size of a city, uh, which you should evacuate a day or two prior to uh, an event, an event like this. And we'll, I'll talk about how how frequent they are, and uh, this wonderful new technology that allows us to uh, be a, a whole lot uh, better about this kind of thing. So everybody knows about the. Uh, dinosaur killing event, and we're not gonna talk about that today. Uh, this isn't the real danger uh, because these events only happen every 100,000 years or so. And uh, this, this last one happened 77, 100, 100 million years or so. And uh, the last one happened 77 million years ago. And the next one's likely to be millions of years in the future if it happens at all. Uh, so that's not the problem. Um, if you really want to worry about an event, uh, there was the moon forming event, which was 4.4 uh, billion years ago, uh, a couple hundred hundred million years after the formation of the Earth, but during the early days of the solar system. And uh, in, in the moon forming event, an object the, the size of Mars collided with the proto-Earth and stripped off a, a 2,000 mile thick layer of the outer surface of the planet. Um, and um, this was actually quite a good thing for us because it means that our planet has, uh, ha has continental drift, uh, which is on the, on the whole a good thing. It's one of the things that helps us, um, it, 
help help life arise and uh, is is important to to us. And it for our technology, it allows us access to heavy metals that otherwise would be buried under uh, a couple thousand kilometers of uh, crummy silicate like lightweight material. So uh, the moon forming event was a good thing, but uh, we really don't want it to happen again. Um, although it, it's thought that some single celled organisms, some lith lithophagic bacteria uh, may have actually survived the moon forming event. Keep losing control of my screen. Okay, well, um, and and uh, then somewhat more recently, there was the late heavy bombardment, which was a, a phenomenon that occurred in the uh, solar system as a whole. Uh, very common meteoric strikes, and it it probably happened because of the inward movement of Jupiter. Uh, this is something that we see nowadays in exoplanet systems where uh, you have a large gas giant like Jupiter and it's uh, moving inward and it would have moved inward and taken out Mars and the Earth and Venus and Mercury and wound up being a hot Jupiter, except that uh, Saturn, uh, uh, the interaction between Saturn and Jupiter moved Jupiter's orbit back outwards and resulted in uh, the where the expansion of both orbits to their current day position. Uh, probably Jupiter originally formed somewhat interior to its current um, orbit and uh, Jupiter, the interaction between Jupiter and Saturn uh, allowed the inner uh, solar system planets, the inner rocky planets to survive. So um, and one point about all of this, people tend to think that orbits are are stable, but that is not technically <coughs> technically the case. Uh, if you if you perturb an orbit, it there's no restoring force that would move it back to the uh, the the old orbit. It, you just have a new orbit. So if you change the energy or the angle of momentum of a body in in a gravitational orbit, um, it it's it's not going back. So uh, the only thing that really keeps us in place is conservation of energy and conservation of angular momentum, and uh, those things are are quite well conserved as long as your uh, bodies in the solar system do not do not uh, uh, interact too, too much. Okay, well, asteroids. So um, asteroids come in a large range of sizes and there are many, many more small ones than big ones. Uh, this is a plot of the, um, the number so so on on the vertical axis is is uh, the size of the asteroid of the asteroid in kilometers and then the the number and both of these are logarithmic scales so you can see that there's a an approximate power law and for um, and down here in the objects that are uh, less than a kilometer in size there are millions of these objects uh, most of which are still unknown whereas uh, up here in the in the uh, sort of dwarf planet category, uh, they they're uh, they're all known. Hey, Tony, I, I don't know just what's going on. Maybe you can or can't do anything about it, but we're not seeing the updates on your screen. If you're showing graphs, we're not seeing that. We're still oh. seeing the uh, the screen from the uh, the video that you played about Russia. Uh, uh oh, oh well. So you've missed like the last six slides. Yes. Uh, uh well, that's not good. So, um, 
why is Zoom doing that? Let me. kill off this desktop. You see this? The uh, no, not yet. Uh, I am screen sharing. Stop screen. Share screen. So you've missed my whole talk so far. There we go. I think we got it now. Okay. Sorry about that. So, gee, um, well, I can go pretty quickly through those slides if you've heard what I've said. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is this is a picture taken of the Chilibinsk event. Um, and uh, here's a, a similar picture of uh, the poor dinosaurs about to be wiped out by a, a, a much a much bigger event. Uh, some pictures of the moon forming event and uh, models of the moon forming event. Um, late heavy bombardment was when both the moon and the Earth uh, were hit by the, uh, a large number of asteroids. And uh, this was the origin of the of the lunar Mara. Uh, the reason there are um, Mara on on the Earth side of the Moon and not on the far side of the Moon is uh, probably because these the ones that hit the Moon in the in, on the on the Earth facing side first went by the Earth and got tidally disrupted by the Earth and then hit the moon as a as a spray of smaller objects rather than a single large object. Okay, so here's where here's my graph. Sorry. Um, so the point is, a lot of lot of small asteroids. So how big is bad? Um, Asteroids are usually discussed in terms of their diameter, um, even though the diameters are known only approximately. And that's because what we really see, uh, what we can really see for most of them is uh, just a point of light, which varies with time and which has uh, spectral properties. So you can do spectroscopy, you can do photometry, but almost all of the time it's a point-like object except in the few cases where we've actually sent probes to the asteroids. And I'll, I'll show you a, a really impressive picture of EOS in a minute. Um, but uh, the albedo of, of, in other words, the, the, um, the blackness or whiteness of the asteroid varies enormously uh, from being charcoal gray to being kind of like dirty snow. And the density varies from uh, comparable to a ball bearing, in other words, solid metal, uh, to something something like uh, cigarette ash. And uh, so really, we only know the mass approximately. But nevertheless, um, by assuming that the albedo is uh, kind of a standard albedo, uh, you can you can assign a, a diameter, and that's what's what's generally done. So here's a, a little movie of Eros close up. So this is from a probe that's uh, very close to Eros. And uh, the thing is tumbling like crazy. And uh, this kind of tumbling motion is the reason that, it's, that it, it uh, varies in brightness. They, they blink on and off. And you can uh, follow that with photometry and even, even spectroscopy. So uh, how dangerous is dangerous? Um, as it turns out, any, any asteroid that is uh, smaller than 10 meters across or so will completely burn up in the, in the atmosphere. So uh, you really don't have to worry about that. Uh, for the ones that are big enough that they don't burn up, the ones that are bigger than 
10 meters in diameter. Um, what you really have to worry about is the is the impact energy, and that's almost entirely due to uh, the kinetic energy of the asteroid. Uh, the fact that there's this great big heavy thing which is moving from from between eight and 40 kilometers per second. Um, you recall the speed of the Earth in its orbit is is 30 kilometers a second. So let's let's um, in our high school physics calculation here take 20 kilometers per second as as typical, and uh, we'll take a typical density. So um, steel is five grams per cubic centimeter, and water is one gram per cubic centimeter. So let's take a, a typical density of around three, which is kind of like most rocks. And uh, so we'll say this thing's moving at 20 kilometers per second and there's three grams per cubic centimeter. And so um, we can calculate that a, a 100 meter diameter asteroid with this density has a mass of uh, 1.6 times 10 to the nine kilometers. So uh, the kinetic energy at moving at uh, 20 kilometers per second. So here's here's 20 kilometers per second squared. Uh, here's the mass, 1.6 times 10 to the 9 kilograms. Uh, that gives us an energy when it hits of uh, 3.2 times 10 to the 17 joules. Well, what does that mean? Um, a megaton explosion is... Uh, nearly two orders of magnitude smaller than that. So uh, the energy of impact from an asteroid uh, of size D varies as, as D over 100 meters cubed. So if D is 100 meters, you get the full 76 megatons of TNT, uh, which happens to be just about the largest nuclear explosion that humans have ever done. So uh, 100 meter asteroid is like a very, very large hydrogen bomb going off and is to be avoided. Uh, a, a, if, you're, if your size D is an order of magnitude less, if it's only 10 meters, so the, the size that uh, kind of doesn't, um, doesn't blow up and it doesn't burn up in the atmosphere, uh, then you're talking 76 kilotons, which is it's just comparable to uh, the Hiroshima or Nagasaki blasts. So how many of these things are there? Well, the ones that are bigger than a kilometer are all known. Um, the, the ones that are bigger, that, that are smaller than a kilometer, but 500 meters, about half of them are known. And then as you get down to size of 100 meters, which as we just feel calculated, uh, nevertheless, is a very big explosion. These up here are the, uh, are the dinosaur killer ones, but there just really aren't all that many of them. But these 100 meter size ones, which are like a, a uh, nuclear bomb going off, uh, there, are, there are millions of them, and only a small fraction of them are known uh, at, the, at the current time. And where are they? Well, this this is an actual video of uh, where these things actually are. So uh, in this picture, the sun is in the middle, and then there's Mercury, Venus, and Earth, and then Mars, and then out here is Jupiter. So the, the asteroid belt is here, this, this where things are very, very dense. But nevertheless, uh, inward toward Mars and toward uh, the Earth, there, there are a lot of these things. And the, the point of them is that they, they're they all mostly, there are a few that are actually going around in the other direction, but almost all of them are going around in um, pretty much the same direction that the planets go around in the, in the, uh, in, in the, in the uh, solar system, uh, just because that's a manifestation of the angular momentum of the molecular cloud that gave rise to the solar system. And so uh, almost everything's going around that same way. Uh, what that means, however, is that uh, the ones that come near the Earth, they will be 
uh, in the vicinity of the Earth for a fairly short time, and then they'll uh, creep away from us. And if they're small, if they're the, if they're these ten meter to hundred meter size objects, um, we'll only be able to see them when they're a small fraction of an astronomical unit. Um, so that an astronomical unit is is this big on this picture, and um, we'll we're only able to see them when they're uh, relatively close to uh, to the Earth. And so what happens for these smaller ones is uh, with with the largest telescopes, as I as I will be discussing uh, presently, you're able to pick them up for a while, maybe a couple weeks, and then. They, they get ahead or fall behind and they don't show up again for another year or two or perhaps even even three. And uh, it's it's hard. What, what you really want is a real is a very, very good trajectory so that you can predict uh, exactly where these things are going to go and whether they are going to hit the earth and if they are going to hit the earth where. And uh, all of that has has dramatically improved in in uh in the in the past couple of years so um yeah what's the situation the 10 meter ones burn up uh there are um 950 of them that are bigger than one kilometer which are the dinosaur killers but uh the likelihood they they only hit once every 100 million years so uh, and 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 we know where all of them are, and we know that if we know in advance what, if they would hit, and we we probably even have enough technology to divert them if we knew that they were going to hit in say 50 years. Um, you you could uh, arrange to nudge them out of the way so that they just missed. But um, and most asteroids bigger than 300 meters in diameter are well are known have well determined orbits. Um, and none, none will hit the Earth in the next hundred years. But the, the, the real danger is for these ones that are between 10 meters and 100 meters. Uh, the vast majority of them are unknown. They're not an exponential threat, an existential threat to life, uh, but you don't want them, uh, you don't want to be under them when they hit. Uh, but so what, what you'd really like is a couple days warning and you get out of the way and then you, you're, you're okay. You don't die. They may, they may destroy the city, uh, but they, but you, you could, uh, save everyone. So, uh, that's what the, the remainder of this talk is about. Oh, well, um, the other thing is how often does this happen? Uh, these are, uh, bolide events just in the last 30 years. Um, there are lots of them, some of them fairly big, most of them in the ocean. Um, there have been some uh, reasonably big ones, even in, in recent times. There's the famous uh, Tunguska one, which also hit Siberia, just like the Chelyabinsk one. Those, it's, it's entirely a coincidence that both of these things hit Siberia. Just, uh, you know, they could have hit anywhere. Um, there's one that nearly hit San Francisco in in 20 uh, in, in 2012, and in uh, and th there was a, a very large one in an airburst above the Bering, Bering Sea um, just a couple of years ago. So uh, these things are not all that uncommon. Um, yeah, it's a. It, Asteroids 10 meter in size may may hit uh, several times a century somewhere uh, on Earth and cause an explosion comparable to a nuclear weapon. So there there are um, a bunch of robotic telescopes that scan large areas of the sky for asteroids now uh, that are currently in operation, and uh, the the uh, five or six of these that are in operation uh, discover uh, several new asteroids bigger than 10 meters every night. Uh, they, they are small telescopes. You can see these are less than one meter class telescopes and you tend to have an array of, of a bunch of them and operate them um, 
you know, in, 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 in the same facility and you operate, have them operated uh, entirely robotically. And so uh, these can detect the asteroids when they're brighter than about 18th magnitude. Uh, but when, uh, you know, so that, that's when they're within, say, four to 10 times the distance to the moon. Uh, then they're easily detectable. But when they're on the other side of the sun, they're 15 magnitudes fainter, which is a factor of um, a, a, a million fainter and way, be, way, way fainter than any telescope of even the, the largest ones we have nowadays uh, to detect. Um, but if you could get, if you could get them a little, a little sooner and follow them for a few weeks and get a really, really good fix on them, uh, you could determine an orbit even uh, even during the the say one or two months when when these are um, when, when these are visible. Uh, these asteroids, the discoveries, are recorded in a public database on the IAU Minor Planet Center. Um, the the all this information is is on the internet and available. Um, so there, there are a wide variety of accuracies in, in the orbital predictions. Uh, some of the newly discovered ones, uh, very little is known. And uh, their or orbital predictions are so bad that there's no way to even recover them the next time around when they are uh, catching up to the Earth again, or the Earth is catching up to them. Of three and a half years later. So um, here's where I come in. This is this is an instrument that I built, and it um, it's it's here. It is mounted on the twin of the Whipple uh, MMT. This is this is the clay telescope in Chile, and this is my instrument called uh, Pisco, which. Uh, was not made for this purpose. It was made to follow up the um, discovery, the discovery of clusters of galaxies by the South Pole Telescope. But that's a that's an entirely uh, different talk. Um, but this instrument has been used uh, successfully to uh, partially solve this um, this asteroid orbit problem. Here's a, a picture of the Magellan six and a half meter telescope. So the, um, you know, the, the it's it's almost a twin of the uh, MMT in uh, in Arizona. Uh, here's another picture of it. So they, you see the the uh, primary mirror uh, cell here. The the secondary mirror is up there, and here's uh, Pisco looking very small. Uh, the the Ladder here gives you a size of the scale of this thing. So Pisco is um, actually seven feet long, um, and 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 four feet in diameter, but uh, is dwarfed by the size of the mirror of this telescope. And uh, here's a picture of the mirror. Here's me and the um, mirror that has been removed for cleaning. So uh, six and a half meter telescope. Not not. The biggest in the world, uh, by by far, there are ten meter telescopes, and there are, are twenty to thirty meter telescopes being built or under under uh, construction or being contemplated. But still, it's it's um, a lot bigger than, say, the Palomar two hundred inch, which in diameter would only come out to about here. So this is the center. So um, the thing about Pisco is that it does uh, four colors at once. So this is some raw raw Pisco data, and here it is put together. This is, this is the uh, first light picture from uh, 2015. Um, and uh, the, the, they're dichroics. The image is split up by dichroics and, and so that the... Uh, so that... Um, you can get the uh, four Sloan uh, color bands simultaneously, and here's this is this is our bread and butter. Um, when you 
it, it, when the South Pole Telescope discovers the Sanyaya-Zlodovich effect, which um, is, a, is a millimeter wave radio effect in the microwave background, uh, that indicates that there's a cluster there. But all we know about that at that point is that there's a cluster. And so with PISCO, we make a, an image. So this is, this is um, actually seven minutes of telescope time with PISCO on uh, a, a cluster candidate position. And you can just see that um, there's a bunch of very, very red things in the middle here. And that is the, um, that is the, the actual cluster. This is, the, the, it's um, six, six arc minutes across this way and eight arc minutes across that way. And, um, the, the, you know, the remarkable thing with PISCO is that it is not that it can take a picture like this. A lot of instruments can take a picture like this, but it can take a picture like this simultaneously. So you don't have to change filters and it all goes very fast. So this is only only seven mi minutes of telescope time. Uh, this is a blow up. So there's the 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 actual cluster um, in the center. And um, Uh, even more blown up. So you see, there's some very, very red things. There's a bunch of galaxy. Essentially, every everything in this picture now is a galaxy, and the red ones are way behind uh, the foreground ones, and the red ones you see are 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 uh, clustered and have subclusters. The uh, interesting thing is that this is a Hubble picture of the same thing, but uh, this is a Hubble picture that took um, three orbits, whereas, whereas the, uh, whereas this took seven minutes. So, um, you know, obviously uh, this is nowhere near as nice as this is, but on the other hand, if you just wanna be able to uh, count the galaxies and see where they are so that you can make a slit mask and do spectroscopy on it and get the colors, um, another thing to notice is that with PISCO, um, there are objects here like this one, which is not there in the Hubble picture or it is very, very faint. And those over there, um, these are not here simply because not that Hubble couldn't do it, but you'd have to put a different filter in, in, the, in the Hubble picture in order to get at those. You'd have to put in an even redder filter. So, um, and, and of course, um, three orbits with Hubble is a, a multi-million dollar uh, expenditure, whereas uh, seven minutes of, of, um, of clay telescope time is a few hundred bucks. So uh, it's very much more economic to take this picture rather than that picture. But now, so what, what happens if you uh, look for um, asteroids? So I did a project with a Harvard student, Anthony Taylor, an excellent, excellent undergraduate student. And um, he, he invented this idea, well, uh, of, of using PISCO to find very high accuracy orbits of uh, these, these smaller asteroids. And uh, here's a... Um, some uh, figures from his from his uh, Harvard undergraduate thesis, and actually this this thesis is wonderful. I mean, this is it's practically a PhD thesis, um, and and the point is that. Um, In a PISCO image, a PISCO image being 40 square arc minutes, uh, there are uh, 10 to 30 stars that are more that are brighter than 21st magnitude. And brighter than 21st magnitude nowadays means that the stars have been observed and their positions determined by the Gaia satellite. And this is absolutely new, and it's completely revolutionary, um, and 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 revolutionizing astronomy. Uh, the Gaia uh, satellite, having scanned the entire sky 
and made a catalog of every star that is brighter than 20th magnitude and determined its position with an accuracy of, of a tiny fraction of an arc second, 10, 10 or 20 or 30 milli arc seconds accuracy. And with um, a bunch of these, 10 to 20 of them uh, showing up in a Pisco uh, field of view like this one, um, it allows you to make a coordinate system for the uh, observations, which are highly accurate, accurate to an RMS level of um, maybe uh, 20 milli arc seconds. So here's an asteroid, and it's being uh, located in reference to these Gaia stars um, to an accuracy of 20 milli arc seconds, which uh, improves the accuracy of its orbit by orders of magnitude. So here's here's some more uh, figures from Anthony Taylor's thesis, uh, where he's um, tracing the the uh, motion of a uh, of an asteroid over a period of so each of these is a day apart on the on the clay telescope. That that night we had a cloudy night, so we didn't do it. But um, and then these are uh, measurement points by other um other observatories one of these observatories of of an array of 10 of one meter telescopes uh found these and then we uh spent a week and got a a uh super accurate uh measurement so here's the um residual errors to an orbital fit and you see it's it's um about 35 milli arc seconds So this is this is part of a uh, long term trend over the millennia of increasing astrometric accuracy. So uh, seconds of arc over here on the left side of the screen at, and um, time here going from 150 BC to the present day and uh, the, the history of astronomy with uh, increasing measurement. Um, Right about, uh, right about here is the invention of the telescope and uh, Hipparchos, which is a, a satellite and Gaia have improved things by uh, four or five orders of magnitude. And this is absolutely new. Um, and it, it's revolutionized many fields within astronomy, including uh, this one, just being able to determine the, the orbits of, of uh, of asteroids. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Gaia. Uh, it's not talked about too much in the United States because it's not a NASA project. It's a, a European Space Agency project. Uh, it was launched in December of 2013, and it's been running successfully ever since. Um, it will run out of, um, you know, run out of gas in, in sometime in the next couple of years. But the uh, resulting catalog of positional accuracy uh, has has been just uh, just tremendous. They've had we're up to the third release of the catalog now, and it's it's um, so so this is this is the basic idea of how it works. I won't go into this because of my problem with time, um, but you, you could look it up. I mean, it's it's a it's a wonderful bit of engineering and not not such an expensive uh, satellite. It's not it's not really gigantic. You can see from this, uh, here's a ladder, right? So this this thing is, uh, you know, and there there's a person. Um, this, this thing's not enormous and it's nothing like uh, JWST, but it's absolutely revolutionized astronomy. It's, um, yeah, it's got a big CCD array and it scans. So I don't know, if you're interested, look this stuff up on the web, it's wonderful. Um, so there, it, it determines several things about star motion because it's been op operational now um, for eight years. And so uh, it sees, it, it's seen the same stars uh, many times over and it's able to determine um, various things about the, the orbit of uh, 
the, the motion of stars. So there's, there's parallax, which is due to the motion of the Earth around the sun. And of course, the size of the ellipse in parallax uh, is, is just a measure of how far away the star is. And Gaia can measure accurately measure parallax up to about 10 kiloparsecs away. So it's done half of the Milky Way. So we've gone from uh, knowing the distance to only uh, a few stars that are that are a few hundred light years away from Earth to knowing where half the stars in the Milky Way are with very high accuracy. And um, there, the, the it also measures proper motion, which is the you know motion just from year to year of the star moving against the background of very very distant things. And then one of the main things it it does is look for exoplanets by the wobble of the star because that the star has been um, the stellar the star is moving around the barycenter of its of its planetary bodies. So, yeah. So the, the point here is that uh, the the Milky Way as a whole, uh, Gaia is telling us uh, essentially the position, the position, the position, the distance. So that's three uh, positional measurements, and then it measures the um, proper motion and it measures the velocity. And so we now have all six of the uh, kinematic measurements for stars that are for half the stars in the in the Milky Way. It's it's just an astonishing thing. And it's a it's a real breakthrough. Um, the point one, my point, uh, though, is that uh, since it's complete to 20th magnitude, there are 2 billion stars on the sky that are brighter than 20th magnitude. And so what that means is, so this is a section, this is a, a an inf infinitesimally tiny section of the Gaia catalog. Uh, you can see the source ID here has got a large number of digits. Um, if, you, if you were to look at one star per second and go through the entire Gaia catalog, looking at one star Oops, uh, one star per second, so tick, 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 tick. It would take you 72 years. So uh, you're not gonna be able to do that. No one is ever gonna be able to do that. Uh, if you wanna deal with this catalog, you have to deal with it on your computer. But on the other hand, uh, it will actually fit on a uh, modern multi-terabyte size disk. So. Um, and it's free on the internet. It's, this is just out there now, and you could download it. And there are certainly an, an, an enormous number of very important discoveries to be made in this gigantic data set. The question is how to do it. I mean, there's a lot of astronomers combing through this data, but there are uh, things to be found. And uh, it's it's available to anyone who's interested. So uh, it's it's just it's just an amazing thing. So um, the next the next thing is the Vera Rubin Observatory, uh, the, the large synoptic telescope, um, is coming. Uh, this will scan the whole southern sky every few days, and will find uh, essentially find all of these uh, dangerous objects during the period where they're close to the Earth. So um, this will be a new thing. It's not an operation yet, but it's it's coming, and uh, it will it will require a lot of a lot of follow up because it, it's going to be um, it, a source of of a very large number of very important um, important discoveries. So just to finish off, um, I thought I'd talk about Oumuamua, which is an asteroid-like object. It's an object picked up by this net, these networks of uh, asteroid search, searching stars. But it, unlike the elliptical orbit around the elliptical orbit around the sun of, of the asteroids, 
this thing was on a hyperbolic orbit. And that is uh, absolutely guaranteed to be an object that has come in from uh, outside, the, outside the solar system. Comets that are coming in from a long distance, coming in from the Oort cloud, are, are on a parabolic orbit. And it's not really parabolic because it's just a really, really, really long ellipse with a very large uh, major axis. And uh, so the, the um, Oort cloud comets are things that were uh, left over from the formation of the solar system, but are uh, very, very far away and not so terribly far that they've been uh, knocked out of their orbit by, by the nearby stars during the uh, subsequent 4 billion years. But uh, Oumuamua was uh, on a hyperbolic orbit and it was and it was a very strange um, object. When it was close to the sun, it accelerated a bit, and there was no apparent release of gas. So that's odd. It also uh, has the deepest light curve, so it varies as it as it we suppose tumbles. Right? We haven't seen a muamua except as a point source of light. Um, it's got a spectrum which is uh, a lot like the uh, asteroids out further in the in the solar system, right? When what you can tell uh, to some extent uh, where asteroids normally live by their colors, and uh, the the colors tend to be diff different and to be correlated with uh, where they are in their orbit, which just relates to uh, what they're made of and how much ice is on the surface and that kind of thing. So um, it it. It looks in color a lot like a um, Kuiper belt object, but it uh, it it very it tumbles way more. It's it's variation in brightness between being on and being between being bright and being dim is very much larger than any other asteroid. Period. So it is unique in that way by a factor of several. Uh, it had this weird acceleration and. Uh, it, it, it's definitely interstellar. So this was uh, strange. And it's, you know, what, one of the hypotheses about it is that it's actually some kind of, uh, you know, it, uh, some kind of artifact, but um, because it doesn't behave like anything we've ever seen before. So it, it's just weird. And it's, and it's not unique. We now know of um, several other ob objects that since, since, uh, 2017, when Oumuamua came by, um, that seemed to be on hyperbolic trajectories. So uh, there's apparently a lot of stuff out there in interstellar space that uh, is is comes in every once in a while and um, zips by and and then goes out again. So. Um, this is the the end here. Uh, the result of this analysis is that we we now have the we have time to develop the technology to uh, perturb away any dinosaur killers. Uh, the present danger, which in some sense we're still in, uh, is the millions of asteroids that are bigger than ten meters but smaller than three hundred meters. Uh, these are being discovered at the rate of several a day. And the Vera Rubin Observatory will discover all, just about all of them. And uh, once they're discovered, we have a couple of weeks to uh, put them into the Gaia coordinate system and get accurate orbital, orbital predictions. Uh, those predictions are accurate enough to be able to uh, pick them up the next time around and tell, tell you whether they are actually going to hit the Earth. Um, if you if you are a worry wart and you really want to worry, you can continue to worry about comets because uh, we can't do anything about comets. If if a comet wants to clobber the Earth, uh, there's nothing humans can do about it. The end. Okay, Tony, thanks uh, for your interesting uh, presentation and uh, thought provoking and hopefully not too much. Uh, 
fear instilling in, in our audience, uh, but uh, great information to know. A couple of questions um, from uh, Jeff. He said he witnessed the great fireball in August of 1972 from Utah and was fascinated about that. And seems like he's noticed um, an increase in the last five months of those or last several months of that and wondered if you have any comment to make about an increase. Um, that, that's almost certainly just random. I mean, the, the, the inner uh, solar system is no longer chaotic. And uh, it was it was chaotic in in the technical mathematical sense, um, many billions of years ago. And the outer the outer solar system out beyond uh, Neptune uh, is in fact still chaotic in in the uh, technical sense, where uh, things can be uh, grossly perturbed and have uh, varying phenomena that are odd. Um, but it, yeah, there's, the, the, there's not in the inner solar system, these uh, near Earth orbits are um, pretty much uh, as they have been for the last billion years. There's nothing, um, they, they, asteroids do come in bunches because they're, they're born actually as uh, the, uh, residual. Well, some of them are born as the residual of a comet being evaporated. So a comet can come in and be uh, nudged into an orbit that is much smaller than the um, Oort cloud, and it, the ice on the in the comet will eventually evaporate. And when it evaporates, uh, you have a loose bunch of rocks, and so that will be a bunch of asteroids that are traveling together. Um, and if, if that has happened uh, a long time ago, perhaps even a thousand years ago, uh, you could, the, I mean, this is how meteor showers occur, right? The, the, the famous uh, meteor showers that occur several times a year are all the residuals of uh, a comet that evaporated long ago. Okay, thanks. Um, from Peter, I was wondering, did Taylor develop a new WCS or is the WCS a product of the Gaia uh, project? Well, yeah, so, well, so the WCS is world coordinate system. So you, when you make an image of, of the sky nowadays um, and, you, and you have an it fits format, which is the standard uh, computer format for these, uh, there's a, a a bit of the header data that's called the WCS, which is the World Coordinate System. And this is how the pixels in the image relate to uh, the, the coordinate system of the sky. And uh, so when you, for each picture, you have to determine a WCS. And uh, what, so what's happened is that by identifying the stars that are Gaia stars, and knowing where those are, uh, those allow you to, to determine a WCS that is very much more accurate than was the case even a couple of years ago. So a couple of years ago, we were, you know, you could get, a, you know, three tenths of an arc second, or maybe even in, on a good night, a tenth of an arc second uh, accuracy. And um, now we're, uh, now we're an order of magnitude better than that. And that is the result of the accuracy of the Gaia stars. And one thing I haven't even implemented yet is the um, correction for the proper motion of the Gaia stars. So the Gaia stars are always moving around. And um, what you wanna know is where they were uh, at the time that the uh, image was taken. And uh, with the, uh, as, as Gaia gets better and better measurement of like of these wobbles and of the proper motion of this of the um, of the stars uh, that information gets better and better and it's uh, uh, gives you this orders of magnitude better uh, world coordinate system okay thanks again um, I had one uh, comment wondering how hard it is to get a, a job at the uh, 
Center for Astrophysical Research at the Antarctica? Uh, well, uh, we um, we hire, well, the, the Center for Astrophysical Research in Antarctica was a thing created by the Reagan administration and expired in 2001. But uh, we, we do have, there's a lot of, uh, it, it was kind of a precursor. It, it was a uh, thing that allowed us to uh, start up the whole enterprise. And the idea was that it, it would have folded up and disappeared in 2001 if it had not been going well. And uh, while we had our, our problems, um, the Antarctic Plateau is uh, an extraordinary observing site. Um, and I, I, as, as a parenthetical comment, I might say that uh, the Antarctic Plateau for uh, the near infrared for JK and H band is orders and orders of magnitude better than any observatory anywhere. And this, you know, this is something the MMT does, for example. If you took the MMT and put it on the Antarctic Plateau, it would be um, the, the noise level would go down a factor of 20 or 30. And uh, this has not been done because um, what, what has been done is, is cosmic microwave background telescopes. So the South Pole Telescope is really a cosmic microwave background telescope and it's um, doing a 10% a piece of the sky toward the South Galactic Pole. Um, and, do, and we're currently at a depth for the cosmic microwave background anisotropy, which is uh, a factor of 40 deeper than the Planck satellite. So um, that to keep all that going, uh, there are hires every year. So um, if, if, if particularly if you're willing to uh, winter over, um, you know, I, for, for 15 years, I, I would hire uh, two people each year uh, that would, um, so we'd, we'd train them the first year. We'd take them down for a couple months to the South Pole and then uh, train them. And then uh, the next year they would go down and would be responsible for a full year of operation of the telescope. Uh, and then we'd bring them back and then uh, for, for a third year, rather than cast them out into the job market immediately, uh, they'd have a third year to reduce their data and kind of decompress and, uh, and, and, and get a new job. So uh, there, there are jobs like that every year. Um, if, if um, you know, you're genuinely interested, you could, um, you, well, you can find them, you can find them on the internet. So they're, they're advertised and um, they're, they're new hires every year. Okay, looks like that's all the questions. Uh, I'm probably sure nobody's wanted to ask it though, is if you were Iron Man or not. Yeah, Iron Man's based on me. That's <laughs> okay. Millionaire Good genius point. playboy. That's me. We really appreciate it, your time and, and your presentation, and I think everybody enjoyed it. Um, uh, I hope everybody can join us again uh, for our next. Uh, uh lecture in the series it's saturday uh april 17th so again that's uh it'll be a saturday instead of a wednesday um and it'll be at 10 a.m or 1 p.m eastern daylight savings time anyway our guest will be dr kelly correct she's a solar physicist at the smithsonian astrophysical observatory and nasa uh dr correct will speak about the current status of nasa's Parker Solar Probe with its mission of making observations of the outer corona of the sun. So that sounds really interesting. Uh, so join us again in 17 days. Again, that's Saturday, April 17th. And we'll see you then. Okay, bye-bye.